Hi, everybody. This is Nancy. I'm the teacher of the visually impaired, also known as a TBI. And um, Carly is going to manage our uh, slides. So, um, uh, Carly, can you get to the first slide, which is get organized? Yep. Give okay. me one minute. I'm having trouble with my computer right now. Okay. Bear with me one moment. Gail, did you want to say hi to everybody? Because I think I cut right into you. No, that's Your fine. Uh, hi, everybody. Okay. I'm Gail Delaney. <laughs> and um, I was going to ask you if uh, some of you have preschool children going to school for the first time, how many of you are in that category? You can put your answer in the chat for me if you want. Um, some of you may have children transitioning from elementary to middle school, middle to high school. So we're going to try um, to address all of these and have plenty of time for questions at the end. And while we're waiting for the first slide to come up. Okay, so Nadia's child, you have a child going to be starting. Let me see the chat here. So Nadia, uh, your child is going to kindergarten. Helen, your, yours is starting pre-K. And I don't know your first name, C. Kim. Yours is second grade, 11th grade. So a, a senior person. Um, and one and a half years old. So going into daycare then. All right. Well, we hope we're going to try to cover everything we can and any specific questions, feel free to ask at the end. Yes, it, it sounds like it's a very broad range. So um, it, this, this presentation is going to be a little bit general. Um, yeah. Everybody has different, you know, disability, uh, visual impairments and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty impossible to cover the details for every specific one of you so but if you do have specific you know concerns about your your child going to school um do do try to um write down your questions and save them for the end or or you can email us at the you know if you think of them later on too all right so we can go to the second slide there we go Get organized. <laughs> All right. Yay. That's Thank you, Carl. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we started with um, getting organized, meaning, um, you know, basically get your, your paperwork together. And um, I'm going to give you a little advice that someone gave me a long time ago. Actually, he's also known as my husband, who said, you know, get a file cabinet. So um, with all of this, uh, all this paperwork we have to live with. Um, I, I really, really love my file cabinet now. So, uh, but anyway, if you don't have a file cabinet, do try to organize your, um, some of your paperwork, including um, your child's medical exam, um, your child's eye exam. Um, the medical exam, you want to have all of that information ready to go to the school nurse the first day of school. You want to include things like dietary restrictions or um, insulin shots or um, seizure medication or eye drops and things like that. And then uh, you also want to have a copy of an eye exam with the uh, diagnosis uh, for their um, folder in school. They're, they all have files in school of, um, that keep track of exactly what you know the eye uh, condition is and. If your child has uh, low vision or some usable vision and wears um, corrective eyeglasses, you want to make sure you have an updated prescription and nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, unscratched, clean, put together pair of eyeglasses. And um, you also want to have included uh, in your search for paperwork, you want to try to find your IEP. And 
when you find the IEP, you want to look in the IEP for um, at least three things. Um, I'm suggesting that you look for uh, what the mandates are for your child. In other words, um, how many times they're supposed to see the TVI or teacher of the visually impaired per week and for how long. Um, and if there are any other kinds of therapists that you want to uh, make sure that they're being seen by those therapists and how often they need to be seen by them. So uh, that's important to know. And you want to know the, the class ratio. So you want to know how many kids are supposed to be in your kid's class and how many teachers and if there's a paraprofessional for your child. And the other thing um, I think you need to uh, look at in the IEP is uh, what kind of equipment is mandated for your child? So if there's, uh, you know, your child needs adaptive software or uh, uh, adaptive seating or, um, you know, specialized equipment like um, light boxes and things like that, you want to make sure that it's, you know, those things are uh, uh, noted in the IEP and then you're going to have to follow up on it and make sure that they're being provided later on down the line. Um, the other thing, the other thing we were uh, thinking you should um, have your hands on are some assessments. So um, an assessment uh, that's really going to be important is a functional vision assessment, which is um, also known as an FBA. And you want to um, make sure you read through that assessment and understand it. And um, if you don't understand it, uh, you want to try to get hold of the person who wrote it for you and make sure they explain it to you because that's the information that you're going to want to give to your um, teacher, your, your child's teacher and therapist and any, anybody else who needs that information. And the next um, assessment that's important is the orientation and mobility assessment. So uh, for older children, um, you're probably going to have uh, one of you, Dorothea, your son may have an O&M assessment already. Um, but for little kids, uh, toddlers, preschoolers, often they don't assign O&M until the child is walking. But nonetheless, you want to get some kind of evaluation to assess basically your child's level of independence. Um, how do they walk, their gait, their posture? How independent are they? Are they, can they avoid large objects uh, using vision? How are they on stairs? How, how aware are they of their environment? Do they sort of understand how the world is put together? Um, and can they travel a route, even a small route? So a toddler or a preschooler, can they get from the sofa to the armchair, to the kitchen table without you. Um, so those kinds of things, we're building a foundation of independence because the goal basically of O&M training is that your child be age appropriately independent as they possibly can be at every stage. Um, so, those um, evaluations, the O&M evaluations will determine if they need assistance or some kind of um, safety monitoring in the classroom or out on the playground, things like that. Um, and to the last two get organized sections, uh, make sure you have a good idea of the school calendar, your, the vacation days, the parent conference days, um, all of those type of dates are important for you to make your own plans. And then before school starts, uh, both Nancy and I want to emphasize the importance of a special, consistent place where they do schoolwork. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, but you want to set up a little space for your child so that it is clear organized, it is theirs. If you need lighting, there's an outlet right near and you know how to position the lamp so that it's the best for their vision. And this makes it kind of inviting and fun for them to 
come home and do their work. So we could take a look at the next slide, which is help your child prepare. Yes. <laughs> so you, you, you can start this at any time. Um, probably uh, at birth is, is a good time to get started with these little little uh, <laughs> uh, sort of home routines. So, you know, if you can, if it's possible uh, at all, you want to, you know, have meal times be consistent and, um, you know, play times consistent and, uh, you know, uh, alone times, reading times, um, homework times. You want all of those things to be as consistent as possible. So, in school, in, at least in preschool, I don't, maybe sometimes in, for older children too, you'll, a teacher will create a visual calendar or a tactile calendar. And, and those calendars. You, you're going to see those on the screen. You can see that they're ta one has objects and one is tactile. The one below it is tactile. Those are examples. Yeah. So what we do is we use a, an object to represent an activity. So you know, if you want to represent, um, uh, you know, snack time, then maybe you'll put a juice box, use a juice box, or, um, you know, if you want to represent uh, bathroom time, maybe you, you'll, you'll use a bar of soap. Or if you want to represent sleep time, maybe uh, you'll use a, you know, a tiny pillow or, or a piece of a blanket. Um, that's for children who are uh, not reading yet or um, not able to, uh, see well yet, so you'll use objects instead of um, letters or um, braille. And, um, but, you know, you, you'll, some form of a, a calendar is, is helpful because the child can begin to predict what's coming next. So the idea is to stick with a routine so the child knows I do this and then I do that and then we do this and then we do that and then hopefully knowing what's going to come next is going to help reduce anxiety and stress um, in, in daily life. Um, uh, and, and, oops, sorry, yeah, Nancy. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Um, in, and in that, yeah, in, in, that, in, in, in that routine, you might want to include jobs. <laughs> so jobs are, um, I can't stress the importance, even as a, a young, young child, of giving the child a job, um, or, which means that you're basically inviting them to be an equal participant in the life around them. So this, especially for visually impaired children, jobs, little jobs, even, oh, could you bring me that cup? Or, oh, would you get that bag off the table for me? Thank you so much. Um, it gives your child the feeling, I can do things. I can contribute. I am equally important. And things don't, they don't sit there while things happen around them. Um, so this is, for me, as a mobility instructor, this is the foundation for me of your child's independence. So have them, when they're old enough, take care of packing their bags for school. Um, and the 11th grader should be packing their lunch or taking care of their money or you know, whatever it is they need during the day. Um, in the home, they should be taking care of their clothing. Even having a child hand you clothing and you can put it in the washer or lifting them up to have them push the button on the machine. All of these things create for them an awareness of what is going on around them and what it takes for day-to-day -day life um, and how it works. And the other part of having a job for me or having little jobs is when people and visitors come to your house, have your child get used to greeting them and speaking to them and taking their coat or offering them something to drink or eat because this is a way to create a bridge to the 
world around them where they, again, once again, they're equal and they're part of it, they're contributing. So these little tiny things I find are actually very big things. Um, you're, you are introducing them to the idea that they are independent and equal. Um, you will also, and for the younger ones, this is very, very important. So Nancy's going to speak about bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, of course, you're going to try to, you know, do as much as you, as your child is able to do. So, right. you know, and, and you too, like you, you can't, not every family can, you know, you know, have a, a schedule that's like includes, you know, this specific, you know, First, you know, at 10 o'clock we do this, at 11 o'clock we do it. You know, that's just is not like very natural. So, um, but to the greatest, you know, degree you can um, develop a schedule or a routine, it's, it's really helpful for, for the children to, you know, grow and, and like Gail says, become more independent. But, you know, if, if your household, you know, if that doesn't work for you, um, if you're just not able to get a routine down with jobs and, you know, activities and stuff like that, um, do try as hard as you can to get a, you know, a wake up and go to bed routine down so that they're going to bed and getting up at the same times every day. So that when it gets, gets to be time to go to, back to school, their, their inner, you know, in, internal clocks are kind of set and ready to go. They're not gonna be, you know, it's, it can be kind of traumatic, I know for me to, you know, be on vacation for a week and then have to come back and be like, oh, God, I have to, you know, get back into getting up at six, six o'clock and, you know, and I, I need more sleep and I'm, you know, stressed out because I'm not going to be able to get up on time and anyway. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is try to make a, a, a go to bed and wake up routine um, as consistent as possible. And, and, and that routine could include things that they like to do, like, you know, if your child likes taking a shower before going to bed or, you know, you can include the, the whole toileting routine, like brushing teeth and washing face and, you know, include all of those, you know, daily living routines in with your go to bed routine. And then, you know, you can also do things like um, let them pick out a favorite book or sing a favorite song or, you know, bring a cuddly toy that, that's you know, their favorite to bed, what, you know, it's kind of like whatever, whatever works and that's, you know, appropriate. Um, I, and I encourage you to try to develop some kind of routine so that, you know, they can get up in the morning and go to school and not be completely traumatized by that <laughs> experience. And I just wanted to add that for older children, um, you want to really discourage scrolling on the phone or the iPad while they're lying in bed trying to go to sleep. And I know this is hard, but you may want to start encouraging things like listening to books or, you know, audio books or something like that, that will lull them to sleep and be a, maybe a healthier way of going into dreamland. So, yeah. um, so yeah. we can take the Speaking next. Of assistive Speaking of assistive technology. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, assistive technology is becoming um, a huge part of education for our kids now. So, uh, you know, there are some things you can do um, to help with that, uh, you know, because it is, a, it is a really important tool, but you don't want to make it so too serious, but you do want to make it interesting to them. So you have to sort of find a balance so that they'll, they'll like the tool and they'll take care of it. So we're, I'm, I'm recommending, I think Gail too is recommending that we do things like we find, um, you know, a carrying case that they like, you know, and it's easy to identify so that they can start to take care of it themselves. Um, be really careful about batteries and chargers. I, I've been hearing horror stories in the news about batteries and chargers. Um, you know, a, a lot of us uh, use light boxes and they need to be um, charged, some of them. Um, just make sure you have the correct battery and charger together and make sure that it's always attended. Don't leave them alone. Like don't plug in the battery to charge it and then go to, 
go to the store or go to bed, make sure you know you're aware of what's going on with the battery. And um, you know, try to get involved as to the greatest degree you can with your child and their um, technology. You know, your iPads. Your, learn how to use voiceover, you know, whatever your child is doing, see if you can get involved and, and you know, make it interesting and fun and, and a, you know, like it's just something the family does, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just a great tool and, you know, you have to learn how to use it and take care of it appropriately. And so on the screen here, I want to point out that we want we want to share a page with you from the website preventingblindness.org. And we're actually going to provide a link at the end of the presentation for you. So I'm not going to go over it too much, but the main point is children, you know, kids are using screens more and more and more, and the older they get, the more they use them. And there are some red flags that you want to be aware of when um, when the, those screens are beginning to affect your child's vision. So you'll see the red flags on the top of that page and you will see some solutions for how to rest, take breaks, how to position the screen um, and things like that. But those are very, very important because children's vision can change very quickly and you wanna be on the lookout for problems that are related to screens. So go. That, we will be giving you that at the end. And we can move to the next slide, which is okay, contacting cool. the school. Yeah. So that's Gail? Nancy, right? No, that's you, Gail. Oh. I'm so sorry. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So you're going to want to be a good advocate for your child and you want to sort of strike the right note as an advocate. Um, and there are several things you can do, which are easy and available to you. So one of the things that's really obvious is join the parent teacher association. If you can, um, this is a place to meet other parents. You can address any issues that or questions that other parents might have about your child, how they learn, if they're curious, is it safe to invite them over? Oh, if we wanna go uh, you know, to the park, are they able to do that? Things like that. You can, you can often be a wonderful advocate at the Parent Teacher Association. Um, along the same lines, if you can, try to make yourself available to go on class trips because a class trip is also a wonderful opportunity to share with others how your child sees and navigates the world and any accommodations they may use. You know, people, grownups and children are curious about canes and how to use them and so on and so forth and you might be able to model for other parents and the other kids how to work with your child um, and how your child uses their cane or um, other accommodations. So part of that is when you're comfortable with your child, you can help other children to be comfortable with your child. Um, so those are two easy things to try to uh, slip in and be part of. Uh, know your rights. You do have rights, and we're giving we're giving several um, websites for you at the end. You can take a look at. But and finally, this is really really important. I think don't write off extracurricular activities for your child. Um, you would be surprised that with just a very few accommodations, there is no reason that your child cannot participate in drama, chorus, sports, like wrestling, debate club, yoga, dance classes, chess, computer, all of these things will help your child to become part of the school community. So keep your mind open to those, don't, don't hold back. Um, our next slide is 
about visiting the school. And this is, um, you'll see on the screen here, a very, very simple tactile map um, of a classroom. And I want to encourage you, if you, if you have an O&M, you want to make sure that your O&M is probably working with your child right now to make sure they know where their classrooms are it's because you want to work in August before uh, the September flood of kids is in the school. So you want to be contacting the O&M now or if you don't have an O&M or your child is a toddler going to preschool or kindergarten, you want to bring your child to school and you can do this yourself and you want to slowly together go in, find the classroom, note some of the uh, major landmarks or things that, that your child is gonna have to encounter on the route to his or her classroom. Um, so you can be a model for your child since you're not gonna be sure where to go. You can model asking for help, following directions, um, using simple, simple mobility techniques like trailing along the wall to feel where things are um, so that you create a simple route and get your child used to the layout of the basic school. Um, I know that when I uh, work with kids in the summer, it's kind of wonderful because the only people that are there are administration and staff. And they're usually so happy to meet us and meet uh, the student. And it's a familiar voice that your child will know, someone that will say hello to them uh, that first day of school. It's a wonderful opportunity for your child to meet some of the people they're gonna be interacting with. Um, and you will want to, if you can, uh, familiarize your child with the simple classroom layout. Keep this very, very, very simple. We usually say the door is home base. So you start at home base and you return to home base. Um, and you know, where is the door, their desk, the teacher's desk, and their cubby. Um, and you know, you just want to give them a bit of the lay of the land so that they can begin to know what they're going to have to navigate themselves. Um, so making a, a tactile map is fun and simple, and you can use household uh, things and arts and craft supplies and foam shapes, and you can almost you can do it almost like a little game. You know, here's here's the water fountain, and then you after you pass the water fountain, what did we find? Oh, it's the door to the auditorium. Oh, and what did we find after that? Oh, there's your classroom. So that kind of uh, interactive, making it a bit of a treasure hunt, uh, will help a lot in the beginning. And great. So then, and the next slide, um, Nancy's going to talk about. Meet the teacher. Meet the teacher. Are we on? Okay. Yep. So it, it just, um, like Gail was just saying, it's um, really great um, if you can get to the school before the school year begins and meet the teacher <laughs> and see if you can kind of like um, develop some kind of a, you know, a rapport like with the teacher. So the teacher, um, you know, sometimes teachers have never worked with children who are visually impaired. So they might not know anything about it and they might, you know, be terrified or they might not know anything about it, but think they know everything about it. And so you might have to go in there and um, advocate for your child. Or, um, you know, if you, if you uh, your child is, um, able to, uh, you want your child to be able to advocate for him or herself. So um, when you meet the teacher, uh, if you can um, plan the visit ahead of time, you want to um, be able to provide as much information about your, your child's vision as possible, um, but make it uh, so, sort of simple um, and e easy to understand because you don't want the teacher to be scared or feel like um, they can't handle it. In a way, you're, you're advocating, but you're also really kind of helping the teacher um, to be able to uh, have, you know, your child's 
spend the school year in a classroom that has sort of a level playing field. So the teacher isn't, uh, you know, treating your child differently from the other children um, to the extent that, you know, your, your child begins to stand out as, you know, different, you know, which is kind of traumatizing for children sometimes. Okay, look. And, so you you want to you want to be able mm -hmm. to um, give your um, teacher a copy uh, and information about your child's mm -hmm. diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you want to try somebody. Okay, someone. Somebody. Okay, someone. 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 Maybe to be muted. I want a little bit more of water. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure Carly should. Yeah, I think we're all set. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, you want to um, be able to tell your your child's teacher that they won't be alone uh, uh, or have to deal with um, all of these issues on their own. They have you as somebody to help support them. They have a TBI, hopefully coming into the classroom at least once a week, and hopefully maybe an O&M an instructor to come in and help them out. So um, those uh, uh, teachers will be able to help your teacher and help your student. Um, you want to sort of be able to explain a lot of what you uh, have on your functional vision assessment that we talked about in the beginning in the first slide. You want to um, be able to explain um, how your child sees or doesn't see. Um, you want to be able to explain if your child is going to be a braille reader or a print reader or some combination of braille, print, and or auditory learner. So they can understand that, you know, your child is gonna need braille or large print or um, bold letters or, you know, they have to sort of begin to understand that so that they can um, be an effective teacher for your child. Um, you wanna um, explain that uh, maybe there's certain seating that's better for your child, like, if your child has uh, no vision on their right side, you want to be able to um, make sure the teacher understands that um, when they're sitting on the right-hand side of the classroom, they have uh, more uh, uh, accessible uh, vision on their left side. So, you know, if she can possibly put the, or he can possibly put your child in a spot that's preferential for that, the specific needs of your child, that would be great. Um, you also want to ask for um, a locker or a cubby that's easy to find. So, you know, like if there's a long uh, line of um, lockers, you want to ask if your child can have the locker on the very end or the very beginning so it's easy to find. Um, you, uh, when you, uh, you meet the teacher, you want to be able to explain to her that uh, your child can't see things like um, if you're going to be watch they're going to be watching a video. So you're going to need the teacher to explain and describe exactly what's going on during, you know, videos or demonstrations or um, anything that's you know visual has to be described to children who can't see. So the teachers don't always understand that, and um, it helps you know when they hear it. And sometimes hearing it once isn't enough. They're going to maybe have to hear it like two, three, four, five, you know, a lot of times sometimes. So um, uh, it's also really important that the teacher understands that um, if your child can't see, they can't. Uh, and she asked the class to, for instance, you know, raise your hands if you know the answer to this question. The teacher can't just point to your child and and, and not use their names. So it's really important that they understand that they don't use body language with your child, that they, they use their name or they use a, a verbal description or, you know, they, they have to learn to be 
more verbal <laughs> and describing more descriptive. Um, if your teacher, if your um, child's teacher is um, still really um, not sure or uh, would like to learn more, there are a couple of websites we've provided for you. One is at the Lighthouse Guild eLearning page, and there's another uh, website called um, Teaching Students with Visual Impairments, which is also uh, really, really helpful for teachers who you know, have little or no experience with um, children who, who can't see. So I recommend that, uh, you know, if you can, um, you know, give them that information. And, um, and then maybe most important of all, you want the teacher to understand that you want your child to more or less be treated like everybody else. So, you know, you don't want to uh, have your child become too, uh, you know, uh, a target, you know, you don't want your child to be the one who gets, you know, special treatment from the teacher because then you're sort of leaving the door open for bullying and you really don't want that to happen. So try, if you can, to, you know, kind of uh, be friendly with your child's teacher and develop, you know, a good uh, communication with them and, and talk to them as, you know, once a week you know, once every couple of weeks and make sure that, you know, they are, uh, you know, filling you in on how your child's doing in, in, in the classroom and how much they're participating and do they have friends and, you know, things like that. So you, you, you have to meet them ahead of time in like net right now, August, and tell them about your child. And then you have to follow up and make sure that things are going, you know, in the right direction. Um, on the next slide, um, just just so you know, um, there are a few links, uh, our web pages for um, that are pretty basic. Um, most people know about them, but you know, in case you don't know about them, here they are: Bookshare, Bard, APH, and PTACS. Um, these are uh, uh, sources of um, large print. Braille and um, audiobooks for your child in case your teacher, um, your TVI maybe, you know, isn't available for, you know, the first, you know, month of school or something like that happens. Um, you want to be able to at least give your teacher some kind of resources so that, so that they'll have something to start with. And they, you know, won't be able to say, well, I don't, I can't, you know, I can't do anything for you. Sorry, you know, because you know, yes, you can, you can, you know, help me help us and, you know, get my child registered, we'll get my child registered with Bookshare and, and, you know, then books will become available to my child, you know. So anyway, those are just a few resources for you to have to back you up. And then the next slide, Gail. And the final slide. I think this is the best one is shopping. Um, My favorite. <laughs> yeah. So um, this again, here's an opportunity to have your child make decisions for themselves based on what's best for their vision. So um, it, again, you're trying to foster self advocacy, you want your child to understand how their vision works. And so Having them make decisions and choices and encouraging them, you know, be clear which lunchbox is better for you. Is it this one? Do you see this one better or this one? Um, things like that. So the whole idea which color stands out, bright colors, contrasting colors, all of those things you want to try to get your child to be able to understand what works for their vision. Um, and you can do that through shopping. Um, <laughs> the other thing is uh, when you're choosing your child's uh, school supplies, like pens and things like that, don't spend money on things that they can't see. So if a big pen writes in a line that, that they can't see, go for a Sharpie or a flare or something that they that will make sense to them because they have to be able to read 
what they wrote or see what they drew. Um, you want to use brightly colored folders and for older children where you have to start to have um, subject folders, use um, bump dots and stick on things or hole punches to make something tactile that they can easily find in addition to using color and high contrast. Um, we have a website for you, if you don't know it already, called Maxi Aids, which has all kinds of things. They sell everything from magnifiers to canes to stick on dots to all kinds of things that will help you in this. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's the basic uh, presentation. And I know I saw a couple of really wonderful questions pop up. So we'd love to be able to get to those. Um, on the last slide is um, Nancy's contact information and my contact information. And we just wanna say that um, we are so happy to answer emails from any of you. So please feel comfortable writing us after the presentation and asking us questions. Uh, I, I know I, I usually don't uh, think of my questions right away. It usually takes me a while to sort of process it all. So yes, please, if you have any, you know, even if it's six months from now and you, you know, you just want to know some feedback about something or, you know, there's something that comes up later on down the line, feel free to reach out to me. Or Absolutely. Yeah. So Nancy, do you want me to read these questions aloud or? Yeah, I, I, I'm on the phone, so I, I can't that see seems, them at all. Okay, let me, um, let me start um, from Z, I don't know, Kestenbaum. Who does the functional vision assessment? Is it the TVI? And the answer is yes, right? You yeah, that's the TVI. That's the, TV, the teacher of the visually impaired will do your functional vision assessment because uh, what, it, you know, what it does is it, it it's somebody, the TVI is somebody who looks at, it's an assessment that's done over uh, usually, you know, it can be done over a day or a week or a month or, you know, sometimes they're shorter, but sometimes they're longer, but basically it's to understand how your child uses their vision. And um, it's, it's so different for every child. It, uh, the, the TVI will want to see your child in a lot of different settings. Like they want to see how your child does, uh, you know, doing close-up, uh, you know, desk work, and then they want to see how your child does on the playground, and then they want to see how your child does in the lunchroom, and then they want to see how your child, you know, so it's all related to, like, uh, you know, how they're functioning using their vision. So can they read the clock in the classroom? Can they, uh, can they see the uh, print on the regular size textbook? Can they <laughs> You know, can they see the lines on on the Lucy on the notebook paper? You know, so the, the the functional vision assessment will explain things like that. Hopefully, in in the youth language that you know everybody can understand. It's not just written for, you know, you know a vision uh, professional. It's written. It should be written so that parents can understand it. So um, we. We have several, uh, two questions here from Kim. Um, and this is actually very, very important. What you're asking Kim is your, your daughter is a dual media learner and she's going to second grade in an ICT classroom. She is halfway through grade two Braille. Congratulations. Um, wow. but she pulled, that's great. It, she's being pulled out to work with her TVI. So she's not fully integrated. So how do we effectively set up learning goals for her, a dual media learner, so that her classroom teachers and peers can include her and allow her to complete certain tasks in Braille, like writing when her TVI is not present. So it, I'm going to go back to, um, making sure your second grader uh, participates in everything she can after school as well. There isn't much in second grade, but at least to get her started, she has to learn Braille. So 
there's nothing you could do about that, but it would be nice if you could somehow make the Braille interesting to her peers and her teacher. You know, if she could share what she's learning um, with her classmates, um, and if you could somehow get the teacher to understand that you're a little concerned that her pullouts are, are affecting her socially among her peers, uh, maybe the teacher can integrate her braille and the things that she does and bring it back to the classroom um, to be shared. And Nancy, you probably have a lot to say about this too. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the exact situation is and maybe, you know, maybe we could talk uh, in email, you know, you could email me and we could talk more about this, but it sort of sounds like maybe the, the TVI could be seeing your daughter during times uh, when, you know, it could maybe you can work on when the TBI is seeing your child. In other yeah. words, so it's not interfering yeah. so much with, with the, you know, class time. I'm, I'm not sure when that would be or, you know, exactly what's going on. So it's kind of hard to, to answer that question really uh, without knowing a little bit more details. We also have a question. Um, would the TBI help with teaching the child how to read and write? My son has OCA1. I yes, the TBI sh should be helping learning to read and write, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if he's, you know, if he's able to read it, I mean, I'm not sure how uh, well he's doing cognitively and, uh, you know, you know, if, if his, his skills are up to it, he should be learning to read and write. Yes. <laughs> Yes, definitely. And the TVI is a central part of that, is a key part of that. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the TVI makes reading and writing accessible to the child. Exactly. That's right? really a, a huge part of their job. Yeah. 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 I mean, if the child is a re you know, a going to be a print, a reader. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little concerned. Thanks for answering that. It's Nadia. Um, just a little concerned because I think his school mentioned like the TVI would only come maybe once a month, maybe every other month. We don't have like weekly support. Um, so I'm going to actually see if there's something maybe like I can, I, I don't think they have funding for it, but maybe it's something I can do privately or something. Well, I think so. I, there are op op options to do things privately. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is well, you know, this is another case. Maybe we should talk privately, but yeah, um, I can send you more. Yeah, because I, I'd you. love to find out more about, you know, what is available and what's and where you are, and you know, all those kinds of things, you know. But once a month is, you know, it, I, I don't know. It, is your child? I know it's he, nothing. It's Canada. <laughs> so uh, oh. now, you're in Canada. So do you, yeah. Do you know about Molly Burke? No. Do you know about Molly Burke? Oh, Google Molly Burke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she's, she's Canadian and she lost her vision when she was uh, 14. Okay. Uh, I, so I Nadia, you, know. you also asked who is supposed to provide or create the IEP? Yes. Because we don't. Uh, the, you, do you have IEPs in else. Canada? We have IPPs, yeah. individual performance plans. Is that the same? That sounds like it, yeah. Okay, but it's, it's more focused on his goals, like, okay, self-help skills um, and behavioral. Is that? Well, that but I guess they'll change it or IP. update it for reading and writing once he's in kindergarten. I guess they will get updated. Okay. He's, how old is he? He is five. And he is, will he, be fine, is, he, is he beginning to, is he interested in books and? Yeah, uh, so like he knows all the letter sounds. He's starting to blend the letters. So we're trying to do like, start to learn how to read at home and things like that. Oh, good, writing good, good. Is, yeah. yeah, but reading, writing is very bad. Um, so we just actually updated his prescription and now he has bifocals, which is very uncommon, they said. So for his age, of course. Yeah. Um, so we're going to see yeah, that uh, Yeah, try, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how 
you know, how his vision is and, you know, what his acuity is, but, you know, large markers, you know, large mm -hmm. bold line paper should help with, you know, even coloring and drawing, you know, just learning those fine motor skills, you know, are yeah. so important. Does he get occupational therapy too? He does. I do that at home. They don't provide that at school. Um, oh, boy. I know it's, it's horrible <laughs> because it's not a public school. I think that's part of the problem. It's called charter, mm -hmm. but I mean, I can email you and we can, I can. Okay, great. Yes. I'd love it, to talk. Thank you for sure. that. Oh yeah. And look up Molly Burke while you have time. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so we have, um, two questions that are that sort of, um, go together. I think one is from Kim and one is from Christy. Um, from Kim, my daughter's behavior sometimes gets flagged as inappropriate when it stems from her not being accommodated and included. What are some strategies to help explain and persuade students and teachers to verbalize what they are doing using more descriptive words and be more inclusive at school? Oh, gosh. Boy, that's such a good question. <laughs> well, it's I mean, so hard to get. It's 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 so hard sometimes to get people to understand, and it takes a lot of tries. Sometimes people have to hear and see it like many many times, right, Gail? I mean, well, it's just, I, people you know, just I don't found, get it. <laughs> I don't know if this is possible, Kim, but often I was asked if it was a you know a, a caring teacher, and I was working with a good TVI. We would do sensitivity trainings where we would uh, put goggles on the other kids that mirrored, you know, that were, that were that made helped them to see what the, our student saw and didn't see. Um, so it was it was a sensitivity training for the classroom and for the teacher. Everybody put them on and tried to get from one place to another, find their seat you know, all of those things. And, and it made it so clear suddenly that, um, oh, if I don't say the child's name, who they don't know I'm talking to them, you know, yeah. all these simple things. So if, and, and there are a whole, there, there are sets of goggles that, that simulate different visual impairments that, a lot of TVIs and schools have them. We would use them and, or we would even make them. We learned how to make them in school. You know, if you have tunnel vision or things like that, you can't follow someone moving very quickly, all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, to get, but to get people to verbalize and describe. Um, Sometimes it's just a matter of not knowing how to do it and needing, uh, yeah. you know, it, needing to uh, see how it's done, you know, it's 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 yeah. sometimes hard for people to do it. You know, it's it's a it's a learning curve. You know, it's a, something that, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, um, I've I've known people who just never really got it. You know, my, I, you know, my brother uh, doesn't understand visual impairment at all. Uh, I mean, at all. You know, and he's my brother, so you know, it it, it it's. It's, you have to be persistent and you have to be understanding and they, they don't understand, you know, they're, they're not understanding. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to take a while and a lot of patience and, um, you know, you have to model for them how to, how to verbally describe things, you know, some people just don't really know how to do it. They don't understand it, you know, yeah. it, it's a skill. <laughs> yeah. Kim, how old is your daughter? She's six. She's um, going to be in second grade. All Everything that you've been saying is so helpful. And I love that you brought up the sensitivity training. Yeah. Um, I think that's um, something that our TVI and ONM is going to do in the fall with the staff and hopefully with the um, students as well. Just, you know, I yeah. want to say she's, um, she's in second grade. She can begin to say simple things like, I can't see that. Oh, definitely. And you know, she advocates you know, for herself you know, really well. She says, yeah. I'm visually impaired. I'm legally blind. I need to, you know, yeah. 
take a closer look. It, she's doing really well in school. It's just that because she's doing so well, a lot of people keep on forgetting how yeah. Yeah. her vision yeah. impairment is. And yeah. um, then it becomes like, oh, she's being a little bit too invasive in people's personal space, right? Mm. Um, and it becomes like a behavior thing. So she gets frustrated and it kind of spirals from there. So we have to keep on reminding everybody that it's actually, she has to be close to people to see what they're doing, yes. to kind of be in their spaces or else she's not included in whatever they're doing. Yes. So we're just kind of so keep on, you, yeah. You, you might wanna to talk to your TVI about it and, and you know, have your TVI work with your daughter about how to, you know, when is it, when is she too close to other people? You know, when is it appropriate, you know, you know, work on those kinds of things too. Right. You know, so you can work on both angles. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this, and Christy has a, a comment um, about her grandson. I noticed that in public places, adults seem to realize that my grandson has atypical vision and they are usually very polite and say nothing about his vision. How do I help other adults feel comfortable without taking over my grandson when I'm with him without his parents? So how, first of all, how old is your grandson? Um, talking over, my grandson is one and a half. Oh, okay. And I don't wanna talk over his head about him because he has excellent hearing. Yes, you know, you know that's yeah. what I mean by talking over. Yeah, you and also you, you're talking about him in front of him. <laughs> so. Right, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I, it's not yeah. up to me to explain it, but you know, at a swimming pool, you know, people talk yeah. and kids play and people notice, but they say nothing. And um, mm -hmm. so, I'm looking for hints. Well. Wow. He's probably not verbal enough to explain it himself. Oh, no. <laughs> so it, it probably doesn't bother him at all, right? It, it, he might not. I think that the um, you can say what needs to be done to accommodate him to the adult, or you can explain it to the adult. And then you could turn to your grandson. What's your grandson's name? Liam. I'm Liam, sorry. That's my son's name. Um, <laughs> and then you could turn and say, right, Liam? Is that how you would like it? You, you, so in other yeah. words, you're including him. He's not verbal enough to say it himself, but you can you can check in with him. Does that make any I, I Yeah, I you know, I, I guess I'm the one I know that I'm the one when I have him like at the pool with me um, to help facilitate. A parent sitting there, you're walking down the steps, he's coming down the step, there's another little child. So instead of silence is what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, uh, uh, he's, he's verbal, he can swim with his little swimmies on and he talks and, you know, I, I just um, don't know how to help them just respond as they normally would. I don't know, I, maybe somebody you, else has I had that experience. If I think if you sort of um, model for them how, you know, how to talk to your grandson and, you know, how to act around him. I mean, if, you, if, if you're comfortable with him, um, they'll be like, oh, okay, there's yeah. no problem well, here. You know? Right. So, you know. We, we were, uh, he, because I'm his grandmother and he likes my old hand, when he sees me, that's his thing with me. He takes my hand and we walk around. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for that instead of his mother making him be independent. But um, so we're walking around the pool and he's meandering. You know, most little kids walk to this and walk to that, but he meanders and then he touches the wall. And, he, you know, we, we have this, you know, he, he does sensory kinds of things and we chit chat. And so it's noticeable because it's different. It's not atypical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just yeah. need to um, just talk like I would normally talk with any you know, stranger and parent and children. Yeah, uh, that's what I would do. I mean, I, I think people want to see, people don't really know how to act. And if right. they see you, you're, you know, the way you're acting, then they'll be like, oh, okay. You know, I guess that's what we do, you know. <laughs> and that's right, because that is the way it is. Yeah. Sorry. It's sort of, uh, you know, 
it's the easy way to to go, and uh, sometimes that's the right way to go, <laughs> you know. Okay. Okay. If you're comfortable, everybody hopefully around you, and if they're not, then you know what? Uh, you know, it, it's it's sometimes just a matter of you know exposure and and yes, uh, desensitizing. Um, you know, so if people see your your child, uh, your grandson once, uh, you know, feeling exploring the wall tactilely, um, you know, then they see it a second time, and I'll be like, oh, there, there's, you know, there they are, and he's feeling the wall. Oh yeah, he does that every time. Oh yeah, okay, you know. Great. Right. So, That's how he learns you know, what a tree is. Yeah. Touches the bark. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I got it. Don't 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 feel bad about those those things at all and the more comfortable you are the more comfortable I think the people around you will be all right so thank you um, Maggie do we have time for two more questions yeah I think we could do the, the last two questions and then we can okay wrap it up in any other ones can you can send through an email okay um, this is from Helen my son is going to a new school for grade nine, four classes a day. The resource teacher has offered to introduce him to each of the classes and to ask classmates to always say their names when they speak. What do you suggest as the best way for a student with a visual impairment who is a teenager to start out in a new class? <sighs> I, I would get the uh, names of the other students. Uh, ahead, yeah. ahead of time. The more information you can have ahead of time, the better. Yeah. And um, if there's uh, uh, some other student in the class that, you, you know, he knows, then great, you know. Uh, yeah. Get to meet the teacher ahead of time and, you know, you know. Find yeah. Sadly, you know, they say they can't even share a class list due to confidentiality. So, yeah, and oh. it's, just, you'll know some of the kids because he went to, um, to the same elementary school and he's just been out for seven and eight but it's hard in high school and he's going to use so many different kids in a day yeah oh uh, um well that's you know uh that's going to be a rough you know probably start and you know the first week or so is going to probably be hard but I, it sounds like it'll it'll work out since he already knows some you know some of the, some of the kids it sounds like from previous years so you know, and then, you know, that's where the extracurricular activities come in and, uh, you know, yeah. chances to socialize with other kids is, you know, so important. Is he a cane user or? He is, but I don't think he'll use it at the school. He'll use it to get from home to the bus to school, but, but not. He in the he's going to hide it when he gets to school or he probably. doesn't need it. He probably won't need it. in. Yeah. The okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you, if you know any of the, uh, the other teachers in the school, and you know, as as long as the teachers have a head up, heads up, and they are, you know, knowledgeable and experienced, and you know, sensitive, you know, they can be there for him and and help out, and you know, hopefully. Okay. Thank you. Know, you. It. it uh, I mean. Teenagers are tough, right, Gail? You worked with more teenagers than well, I have. I did a lot of work with teenagers, and I'm going to say that it, it really comes down to how comfortable they are with themselves. And that's yeah. not something you can just snap your fingers and have it happen. But um, if he can learn to be comfortable and accepting of his vision, others will follow suit. And it really comes down to that. Um, the more awkward he is about his vision um and, and this is a stage a lot of kids have to go through um it's just coming to terms with who they are and the vision yeah. is part of it but it's not all of it you know and, and when we were would be doing mobility a lot of times with my teenagers I, I couldn't believe they could hide an entire cane in their sleeve i mean it just was so yeah. amazing to me but I, I had one boy who was severely visually impaired and he was just, he was comfortable with himself, you know? It, 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 and he wasn't always, this, this didn't happen until he was more like 16. 
And people would come up and say, oh, God bless you, and all this, and all that, you know, all kinds of comments meaning well. And he would just say, I'm good. Don't worry. I'm good. I'm fine. You know, and, yeah. and he was able to move through these awkward situations. Um, and, and the TVI should be able to, yeah. you know, help out with these things. And also, you know, there are counselors and social workers. And, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't, if I had a teenage son, I wouldn't hesitate to, you know, offer whatever support was out there, you know. And, and, and also those uh, outside um, interests are, are so important. You know, if music is his interest or, you know, uh, baseball or, you know, some, you know, certain books are interesting or science is interesting or that's where the extracurricular, you know, and when you find other people who you have similar interests with, it, it, you know, it's the same as any typical teenager, you know, really. You just have, you know, an additional uh, ability <laughs> that is, you know, and, 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 you know, as everybody knows, everybody has something, you know, some problems to deal with. So, you know, the, the extracurricular and the uh, other interests and, you know, just making a friend, you know, is uh, that, that's what gets you through, in my opinion. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, another thing is to, to help him practice how to uh, talk about his vision so that yeah. he, you know, so that he's clear, doesn't, you know, and comfortable with, with talking about it. Um, and that but, will help him a little bit. Sometimes there are uh, role models, uh, you know, I know that. I, uh, I'm not real big on social media, but there are, you know, people out there who are blind or visually impaired who are really good role models who might have similar interests to your, you know, a teenage kid who, you know, is slightly lost, you know, and that, that might change everything for them, you know. And, and sometimes jobs are <laughs> the thing that really gets you through because when you have a, a job and responsibility and then you get paid for it, it's like, you know, huge <laughs> when you're a teenager. So, you know, there's, Thank you. there's stuff out there. Yeah. Good luck. So, we have a question about, we'll take this as the last question, I guess. Um, but, and, um, so the school uses a lot of handouts that students have to fill out. Apart from using a CCTV, colored, bold, lined paper and enlarging the handout, are there other ways to make the handouts accessible to a dual media learner? Nancy. So it depends on what the source of the handout is. Sometimes they're available, uh, you know, they're online sort of handouts and sometimes they're accessible with voiceover or um, you can make them larger on, on the iPad or um, you uh, can make them larger on the computer or bolder on the computer or on a Xerox machine or uh, things like that. But, um, you know, when, when teachers have handouts, they usually have them in advance. Uh, so if they can, uh, Give, them, give you the material in advance so you can make the adaptations uh, in advance. Um, that's usually helpful too. Um, but I, I would find out what the source is of the handout and then see if you can uh, get, uh, you know, I don't know if you need large print or um, voiceover or I'm not sure what, what uh, kinds of adaptations you're making with Braille or, or what you're using. So, but at least you you should be able to get the handouts in advance. So, you know, you're you're not, or you know, your child's able to do the classwork when the other children are doing it to you know the greatest extent possible. And we have um, this is a comment more than a question from Lisa. 
Um, be careful about the comment of learning Braille if her skills are up to it. Our daughter's TVI didn't, th didn't think our daughter could learn full Braille, so she provided a customized Braille for her. It wasn't until we sued the school district and moved her to a school for the blind that she was taught all the contractions. So, um, yeah, all the, you know, each TVI is, you know, you know, it, it's like anything, there are good, you know, good people who are really good at what they do and people who, you know, are not as good and are still learning or, uh, you know, whatever the case might be. So it's imper important that the parents sort of, you know, that it sounds like the person who wrote that comment was, you know, had a, a different opinion than the TVI. So, you know, when you have a different opinion from the TVI, it's, of course, you know, you, you, you have to have a good, you know, re a relationship with your TVI and you have to make sure that they're they're making the right accommodations and adaptations for your child. It's it's you know it's not always you know just because there's a TVI or an O and M uh, specialist available, it doesn't mean that they're getting exactly what they should be getting. It just means that they're getting something. <laughs> so it's up to the parents and the child to you know speak up and say uh, you know I I think I need something different. You know, I don't, this isn't working for my child. And, you know, I think, you know, and, and you know, kudos to that, that, that family because, you know, you, you have to follow up on, on, on all of these, uh, all of these accommodations and make sure that your child's getting what you think they need. I'm the person that wrote that comment. I was just going to state that this is a TBI that teaches the TBIs. Um, very oh. experienced, but just didn't believe in our child and what she was capable of. So, and we had a very good working relationship with her, but what do you do when they still don't believe in your child? And so that is, I think, what happened. And then the, the problem is that everybody listens to the TVI because they think, oh, that person's got 25 plus years experience. So um, the whole school district then listens to that TVI. And then you have a real problem on your hands because then you're trying to convince lots of people on an IEP team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, she can do it. I know she can do it. <laughs> Especially yeah, if there's multiple I mean, it, disabilities it, involved, right? Then it gets even more complicated because yeah. the TBI may not know about those other disabilities. They mostly really only know about the, the TBI part. That's what they're trained for. Yeah, it's it's complicated and it's hard. I mean, it, you know, it's like going to a doctor and, and you know, the doctor diagnoses you with one thing, but you think it's another, you know, it's like, ugh, it, you know, but, you know, don't, don't give up, you know, you're, you're the parent and it's your child and, um, you know, you'll have a TVI for maybe a year and then you'll have a new TVI or, you know, things change and, you know, hopefully it doesn't come down to a, a lawsuit, but, you know, sometimes it does. So, you know, know your rights, as we said in the beginning. <laughs> know your rights. I just wanted to make sure everybody was able to, um, I'm just gonna read these last comments and then we'll sign off because it's for handouts, this is from Helen. My son scanned them into the iPad Pro with an app called PDF Expert or Claro Pro. And he could then make the handout as big as he needed and filled it in with the Apple Pen or keyboard. Uh, keyboard. Uh, and it worked very well for my son. So I think uh, that's um, something to know about. Um, okay. So the Notability app is another app that um, is mentioned here in the chat. So just to make sure everybody uh, got that. Um, wow. yeah. That's great to know. Yeah, yeah. I All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, there's so, I mean, I feel like parents often know, you know, more than TVIs. And, you know, it's so important that parents speak up. So speak up, <laughs> you know, make sure, you know, do your homework and, and don't be, you know, don't be a wallflower and speak up and, 
but uh, also um, be able to listen, you know, because the information comes from all different, all different people in all different ways. So, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't know as much as I think I know, and sometimes I know more than I think I know, and, uh, you know, so you just have to kind of speak up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gail and Nancy, uh, for joining us tonight. And as Carly had mentioned earlier, we will be sending out the recording to everyone along with the handout. So if you do have any additional questions that come up, please feel free to reach out to Gail and Nancy directly.